Google starts. Uh, very clever idea. It's a very simple idea, which is very clever, and that's what the company was founded on. Uh, the basic version that we're going to do comes from a tech report that the founders wrote when they were still grad students at Stanford. And of course, beyond that, a lot of that is from hearsay because Google doesn't want to reveal what exactly happens. So people try to do it. And some of this is going to be a history of how web searches happen. So first question, and this is easy enough. Everybody sort of interacts with Google or any other browser of your choice, uh, search engine of your choice. So what are the requirements for a web search? So if you want to search, and this is in general it's extensible to other kinds of information retrieval as well, but let's just think of web pages because that's the context in which we are looking at it. So what would be the issues? So how would you want to do it? And if you know how exactly this works, you can hold on to your answers for a few seconds at least. So I just want to hear some answers. Let's say that for those of you who might have never thought of this before, how do you think Google would do it? You've got millions and billions of web pages and you want to go and search for, I don't know, tractors. So if you search for tractors, how does Google know what to show you? So what are the challenges there? Yes? Well, if you just search the entire internet for just the string tractors, you're going to get a lot of pages yes. that fit that requirement. Yes. And so, so so you'd want to somehow find the pages that are actually relevant to tractors, kind of guessing, okay, well, they probably want maybe, you know, the big machinery tractor. So maybe words related to tractors in a certain context, you maybe prioritize those pages. Okay, the two separate issues, I want to sort of rephrase these. The first <coughs> issue is, of course, just the, the sheer act of going and saying that here is a, a string of sorts, whatever your query is, and actually going through all of these billion pages, let's say, and actually finding out which of them actually contain this word or match in some way. So this is similar to the similarity uh, situation that we had. But of course, now think of a billion pages. It's not a billion by billion, but you're still doing one against a billion. So you're doing that many comparisons. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that if you search, as you mentioned, for something as generic as a tractor, you know, we have a billion pages, so we probably will end up with at least a million pages which satisfy this criteria. So then the question is, how do you actually give the result? Is the best result maybe a page which only has tractor written a million times on it? Probably not. That's probably not what you're looking for. So how do you actually decide which of these pages is important. So Google shows you maybe 10 links at a time. Okay? And particularly page rank is kind of helping you answer the second question. But let's talk about the first one for a minute. How would you do the first one? Or what might be a reasonable way to do this? Because I'm not going to talk about that today, but I want everybody to sort of at least understand. Yes? Break the universe of all websites into blocks and have it distributed. But I guess I know what you're saying, but that is very inefficient again, isn't it? Because what are you going to do? So think again from, there was a period, it's become less common now, but about, I think, five to seven years ago, all of these desktop searches became really popular where, you know, you could enter a text query and it was faster than opening up every file in your uh, machine and searching through that. Do you see the difference? So how would you do, so how, 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 how does something like that work? So you create an index, right? so you create a reverse index. So you say that here it is, let me create. And you can look at it in multiple ways. You create an index of all the words. So you take your words and see, figure out which files have it or a collection of it. You can go with a feature vector now. So you know, like we created these cosine vectors were based on what kind of words were occurring in each book. So I could have used that to figure out which books might have one of my words, right? Because the distance is going to come up higher. So that would be the first case. And the earliest web browsers all did only this. They created these massive indices so that as long as the keywords were there and they could find it, so they built it based on these meta tags that were there, these HTML meta tags, which classified subjects and so on. And many of them went further inside the main content of the 
file has extracted these keywords. So that was fine. You can reasonably expect to find or filter out the specific web pages which have content hopefully related to your, um, what do you say, um, the, the query that you have. But now let's assume, I don't know, maybe you would just query for tractor. And now let's assume that tractor is a, is a rock band. And let's say that tractor is also some new uh, data analytics framework. Okay? And so when you log on to one of these machines and you search for a tractor, maybe you're a farmer, right? So what you might be interested in when you punch in tractor is going to be different from, say, uh, a rock star versus what you as a web developer or a data analyst or a data scientist might be interested in. So now comes the additional topics. How do you have this? Because the context is very different. And now storing or increasing these lists based on the context is going to be very difficult. right? So the second part of the question I've sort of diversified into two separate issues now. The first is, of course, you've got a million queries, uh, results back from Tractor. How do I figure out which 10 are important? How do we account for personal taste? So let's get on with the slides. And again, keep interact, interrupting me and uh, let's keep this somewhat interactive because this is something that most of you can relate to, so it's easy. And there are some mathematical concepts here, but we will sort of easily ease into them. So the inverted web indices we already talked about, so there are too many, and so you can't be expected to go through each of those million results to find what you're specifically interested in you really want. This is why Google became really popular because it was showing you the kind of things that you wanted to read. Right? That's the key factor. The relevance and quality are very, very important. And so it comes down to the definition of how do you define what is a high quality web page? So if you search for tractor and John Deere comes up, is that a high quality uh, result? Is the Wikipedia page for a tractor a high quality research? And why would you actually define it that way, right? So you want to think about, you're probably happy with whatever, I don't know, you can, one of you can probably do a search right now. Um, what is the first link that comes up when you search for tractor on Google? And why do you think that's a good, why do you think it's a good or a bad result, right? So, and ever since the earliest days of the web, spam has been an equally big problem, which is that the more somebody like Google tries to give you the kind of web pages that you're interested in finding, you're gonna end up with people who want to spam you with, you know, here, buy a tractor for $100 and it'll work as well as anything else. So the question is, how do you detect and avoid spam in these cases? So later on, towards the end of this lecture, hopefully, we'll get to a situation where I want all of you to basically don your spamming hats and see how you can fool the algorithm that you're going to work towards, right? So some of the earliest work in this area was sort of predates uh, the web search itself, and I like to say the internet, but maybe not completely, which is where people were interested in trying to find high quality scientific publications. So this is, you can think of a much smaller pool, you have a list of papers, how do you actually figure out which papers are worth reading? So for at least those of you who are PhD students, how do you give importance to a research publication? Right. So does everybody know what a citation is? Yeah. So this is the number of times that somebody else think this was worth reading and I got something out of it. Hopefully. Hopefully they're not pointing at this. But even that might be important. But effectively, citation sort of gives you a link towards the general idea that Google does, that you have a large set of public uh, web pages, let us try to see if we can identify which pages are cited or linked to in, this, in the context of a, in, of, a, of a web page effectively by maximum number of pages. So if you think about it, that would give you a sort of a relative importance. So if you have New York Times, then 
a lot of people, a lot of websites probably link towards this. So, you know, all roads lead to Rome. So that's an important web page and it has a higher weightage than anybody else, right? Let's think again. So this is a simple graph. So think of just four web pages. We boil down the whole internet into four web pages. And these arrows, remember, I talked about directed and undirected graphs. In this case, it's a directed graph because if you link to some particular website, it does not mean that that website links back to you. It might be true, but it's not always true, right? So in this case, this is our simple graph. Oops. And I define a transition matrix. This is just a little bit different from the matrix that we defined earlier, okay? And let's see how it is different. Wherever I have non-zeros, if you enter ones, then that's going to be the matrix as I initially wrote it, right? So let's sort of just quickly check that. So A, B, C, D, and so on. So who all, uh, where is A linking to? A has an edge going out to B, C, and D, right? These guys, okay? But you see that instead of one, I have put one over three. Why? Your previous assignment should have told you something about it. Yeah. So this is normalization. We are doing the same thing that we did for the cosine distances. We just normalize it. Okay. So we want to make sure that each column sums up to one. Okay. So the outward traffic is normalized. Okay. Because what we are effectively calculating is a probability, and I'll define that in a minute. So if you think of B, there are two outward edges going to A and D. So A and D get a transition probability of half each, okay? And similarly for C, C doesn't really go anywhere except for A, so there's a probability of one that it, if you visited C, you go to A, and similarly for D, which has an equal probability of going to either B or C. So now how does this help us? So first of all, given a set of web pages, would you be able to construct a graph of this sort? and a correspondingly a matrix. So you look at any page, see how many links there are. The URL of a, let's say a web page is a label for its index, you know, the, the specific index in the matrix. And that's it. So we can figure out how many links there are. Any link that goes out gets one over the number of links that you have. So how does this help us in terms of figuring out what would be a good way to figure out if a particular web page is important or not. So we have the graph and we have a corresponding link. So now let's sort of imagine from a crowdsourcing perspective. Let's say that I take all of you, I give you a browser with no location bar, no forward or back buttons, and all that you all can do is to browse. I start you off from a random web page and then you can start clicking links, okay? So this is a random surfer model. So I take all of you and I just give you this, and the only way you can browse is to follow links. So if you start off from any one of them, you're gonna keep clicking on links, right? So now what happens in the limiting state? So after some point, as you're transitioning, and we prove this, uh, you're going to settle down or probabilistically, a certain percentage of you are going to end up on A, another percentage is going to end up being on B, C, and D, right? This is going to be the stable situation. And that gives us, the number of you who are on A gives me a relative weighting for how important I think it is, right? So from a perspective, can you guess which one of these might be the most likely candidate. So what is it that you might want to do? What is going to maximize your chances that as you are randomly browsing that you're going to end up on a page? Intuitively, we'll, we'll look at it mathematically. Sorry? More, more, more people are linking to you, right? That's what is going to increase the probability. And this, that's why it sort of links up with this whole notion of citation. If, if more people think you're good, and this, you can imagine, this is a small example, but if you have a large one, 
it's not just who links to you, but it also depends on the amount of traffic that that person who's linking to you gets. So if New York Times has an article which links to my web page, that's definitely better than one of you linking to my web page saying my professor, <laughs> right? So, so that's sort of the other aspect as well. So imagine why, understand why this is a more complicated problem than just observing how many links I have, right? So that would be the naive version of it. If I have a million people linking to one web page, then that's good. But you really want to do this over the entire internet, and you want to cumulatively gather this. And that's where it becomes a little bit more um, expensive as well. Is this sort of clear, at least at an intuitive level, what is happening and why it's important or why it would make sense to want to compute something like this? Okay. So how do we do this? So we define a vector v. So we have a value on assigned to each web page, which is the probability distribution for so it's over algorithm. Each page has the, is the probability that a random surfer exists or is currently browsing this particular web page. Right. So we are interested in computing this probability distribution over the entire space of all the web pages. So a good initial guess would be that everybody, so if there are n web pages, then the probability is uniform to start off with. So you might be browsing any one of the n pages out there, right? And we are going to keep iterating on this. Okay? Does that make sense? What does this iteration mean? So try to understand. So we start off with equal probability of being on every single web page. That's a reasonable thing to do, right? There's no bias in terms of who has content. We'll modify this eventually, but for now, let's say that it's equal probability. And now what we're doing is that we're saying that if this was the probability v, then after one click, after every single one of you has clicked on one value, one link, what is the probability? How much has this changed? That's going to depend on the transition out here. So this is basically a Markov process. We're saying that at any given stage, my state at the next step depends only on the current step. So there's no history out here. Anytime you are there, you're just going to click on one of the links. It's not like, we're not making an assumption that because you came from New York Times, you're going to end up going to CNN. There's nothing. If there are three links out there, I have equal probability of clicking on any of them, right? And it's independent of my past actions. So the new version of the probability, so if I started off with V0, V1 is going to be M times V0. Is this clear? Right? So there was a certain probability that I existed on node A. Then the probability at each of the other ones is going to be this probability multiplied by the probability of me taking each of these paths, right? You can look at the opposite way. The probability at the next iteration of ending up on A would be all the in edges, in this case, C and B. So what are the, in the previous step, what was the probability of being on B and on C multiplied by the probability of following each of those links, right? And that information is encoded in this transition matrix if you were in A, what is the probability of ending up in B, C, and D, and so on, okay? Is that clear? So this gives me one step. We want to keep repeating this. At some point, we are going to reach a stable situation where VK plus one is basically gonna be almost the same as VK. And that's when you're going to stop. So this is the. So you are computing this limiting distribution. So there are proofs that as long as the graph is strongly connected, that is, you can reach from any one to another one, and there are no dead ends, which means that you can't just end up in a web page which only has incoming links and doesn't link up to anything. So this process will basically get accumulated, become acts like a sink and all the traffic is going to end up there because, you know, it's like Hotel California, right? So you can't really leave out of that. So 
Mathematically, what is it that we are trying to solve? We are trying to figure out an eigenvector. So it basically ends up being an eigenvalue problem. So for those of you who need a quick refresher of linear algebra, you're effectively solving something like this, right? Which is equivalent to this, okay? Which, of course, you would realize is a variant of this. In this particular form of a graph that we have, the largest eigenvalue is actually 1. We can prove that later during one of the actual classes on graph algorithms. But that's what you're trying to effectively solve. But what if we just simply look at mv equal to v? How do you think we should really solve this? Are there ways of solving this? I told you one way that we could keep multiplying it. So you, at some point, you basically get something like m to the power k v, and this is v is equal to this. And so I'm done. I stop at that point. But in general, if I gave you an equation, and you're sort of computing these kind of things for your assignments now. So you're doing m times v, a matrix times vector, right? So how would you actually want to solve this? Linear algebra, anybody? What are the possible ways of solving this? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can do an inverse, right? So, so one way to do this would have been that you say that v, the optimal v, is m inverse of v naught, the equal probability that I chose. Why wouldn't we want to do this? Or how would you actually do this? It's not always possible to have. Yeah, it's not always possible. Let's assume that it is. It's not singular. But how would you compute this? Let's say I change the assignment that instead of doing m times v, you need to do m inverse of v. So how would you do that? Because m is changing. M, is, m doesn't change, at least for the scope at which we are operating. When you, when you add new web pages, yes, it changes. But let's assume that we work with an instantaneous snapshot, so nothing is changing. The transition matrix doesn't change. So if we could, this is, this is not wrong. But the reasons why we don't want to compute this So what ends up happening, I'm going to not write it anymore, <laughs> is that when you solve that, when you iterate on this, you're going to, you can factor out the largest eigenvalue and the eigenvector, and everything else is some number, which is basically lambda i divided by lambda max, which is guaranteed to be less than 1 to the power k. So as k keeps increasing, all the other terms keep becoming progressively 0, because you're multiplied by a factor which is less than 1 to the power of a high number. Right? So as you iterate, you're basically getting closer and closer and closer to uh, the primary eigenvector in this case. Uh, you can stop by. If you guys are interested, I can do a separate longer lecture on each of them. Our question out here. The web, unfortunately, is not that simple. Right? So imagine the structure of the web. You have one central piece, which is a strongly connected component. So this would be your regular internet as such, where everybody is linked up together, which means that you can, if I gave you this constraint of not necessarily entering URLs, you could follow links from one place and end up somewhere else. So they are connected to each other. You have another part where these links are connected to the main part. So these might be, I don't know, your MySpace pages, which link to everybody else and nobody else links to you, uh, except from within, inside out here. And similarly, you have an out component wherein the main web points to these pages. Think of it like documentation pages for Spark. It only goes from Google or any of your standard blogs to those pages, but they never or rarely would link back, right? So you have these in component and out components, and then you have sort of these tendrils which independently branch out. The other problem, of course, is that you have these kind of independent domains. These do not link to any part of the main internet. They are there, URLs are there. If you know the URL, you can enter it, you can go there, and they have their own self-contained communities. To some extent, you can th think of as obscure languages or you know, somewhat uh, your dark nets, so to say. So, where in, sorry? No. So, so in these cases, you are not connected to this. How does this affect 
our process of estimating the page length. If you were to solve our system the way we said, so V is equal to MV, what is the value, what, what value are you going to get for these guys? Exactly. It will stay. You're trapped in these cases, right? Similarly, if you start off from here, you're going to end up consequently and end up in these areas because that's where the traffic is always so. Effectively, you might have some flow in between, but it's going to get skewed towards these areas where all traffic is going in. So whenever you have these kind of dead ends, which basically you are pointing into and not going out anywhere, you're not going to get this. In a matrix form, all of these basically point to singularity, and you'll get trapped and you start getting biases out there. So the two most cases, common cases that we think of are dead ends, such as this one out here. So you're following links to a page where you can't get out of, so your system fails. The other are spider traps. Spider traps are specific uh, structures within the internet. So there's a structure of web pages designed to boost page rank rankings. So you want to make sure that when somebody searches for pizza, you end up coming, you know, your page shows up higher than you know, Papa John's or whatever else is out there. So what you can do is, you know that most people are going to search on Google, you understand how Google ranks its pages, so you can artificially start boosting your numbers. Okay, so you start manipulating the structure of the graph, corresponding to the matrix, the transition matrix, and that shoots it. How can you handle dead links? So this is not the only way to do it, but let's think of simple ways. It's there, but think about Get creative. Let's just do a simple pass. It's easy to spot dead links. These are pages with no, no links at all. So it's like a normalization issue. Just get rid of all of them. It's zero, so it's a divide by zero error. Remove it from the graph. Generate a nice graph and a correspondingly a nice matrix which has no dead ends. Compute the probability of each and every page of a random surfer being on a random page. And then you can do one final projection onto each of these dead link links in terms of computing the probability that somebody from the regular fully connected part would end up in these pages. Yes? Ma'am. So basically, uh, when you get the ID decomposition, you, uh, you sort of uh, end up with uh, the, the direction of the largest motion. Okay? That's how I look at it. Sure. So, uh, So it's telling you which pages are most important, okay. right? So if you think of this large vector that we have, right, where I have, so so it's basically you define this large vector where each page is one coordinate, right? What I am doing is that I'm taking this entire large space, which might be a billion more, and orienting it according to the relative significance of each of them. So this is the the way in which I am aligning this up. And that's what it is. So once you align it, the pages which are more dominant, who are more well connected with everybody else, are going to be in the dominant sector. Basically along this end. So the projection on the, the primary eigenvector is going to be maximized. And that's what you're looking for. And that's what is basically a more dominant page or a more important page. It's the item vector, right? It's the primary axis, it's the most dominant axis. So we're only looking at the primary eigenvector. No, there's not, you're not looking at a set of eigenvectors. Okay? We're only looking at a one eigenvector. So let's let me let, let me give you an idea. So here is a matrix, right? This is my transition matrix M. How many rows and how many columns? 
And what is n? Right? What is the primary eigenvector going to be? Yeah. So the values of each of these is going to tell me what is the relative importance of each of those pages. <coughs> oh, of each of those n pages. Okay. So if you want the geometric case, let me give you the 2D interpretation. What it means is that if I had a two-dimensional uh, data set, right, and the distribution was kind of like this, this part that tells me that x and y are equally dominant, right, so the eigenvector is going to look something like half comma half, right, that tells me that x and y are equally dominant. If it started to get more like this, you're going to have a higher value for the y coordinate and a smaller value for the x coordinate. That's basically what you're seeing. So the alignment that the eigenvector reflects tells you how strongly you are leaning towards any particular direction, or in our case, the direction is the vector. So, so the space, what is the space? I mean, it's a space of... Uh, it's a very large space of all web pages. All web pages. Web pages. And you're trying to effectively see that in this... It's a very, very sparse space. So the weights tell you how much each of those pages is important. So what you're kind of looking, if you want a much more uh, direct interpretation, you're trying to find this axis where all your pages, as they project onto it, are maximized. So that's the maximum spread out there so that you can separate them out. Right? So in the direction in which the maximum stretch is there, I have the maximum capability to separate out my coordinates. And within in that direction, the particular web pages which have the maximum projection onto this are the most important ones. That's what you're sort of looking at. Those those dimensions or in this case a particular dimension, because we are looking at an N by N matrix, it's really the number of web pages that you have. Does it make sense? Loosely, yes. Yeah. So according to my understanding, that uh, we are we have a space of web pages, and each of the points in the coordinate uh, actually points uh, actually represents the web page it does. in the space. Yes. And we are trying to align all those web pages which are similar to those along the axis of the eigenvector. So uh, right. So the eigenvector is effectively trying to define the, the most space. dominant yeah. of spread of all the web pages. Yeah. That you have. Over that, you are telling the projection. Yes. Okay. So, the projections of one of the web page over that axis, with how much it will, uh, I mean, uh, give us the similarity value? Well, the, the projection, because of the way we have chosen our dimension, that each page is one point of this n dimensional vector, yeah, but we have that coordinate is the projection of the the that web page onto the axis. So the values of your eigenvectors are actually, the, in this case, because of how we have chosen it, right? We have chosen each of our web pages to be a, a separate dimension. So the value of our eigenvector is giving me the projection itself. Each in, of the is separate dimension. It is, right? In this n-dimensional space. Okay, in the, yes. Right? What I have looked at is this correlation, which is defined by the graph out here. So you're looking so you at it. So you have features on that yeah. represent the dimension over that web pages. Maybe you are categorizing those web pages. Just in a different yeah. cases. Yeah. Yeah. Different but then you're not really categorizing the, the, yeah. the web page at all out here. Okay. What you are doing is to compute the eigenvalue, uh, the eigenvector of the graph. Yeah. And again, it's, it's a little bit different from the conventional notion that you might have if you had, let's say, a sample of points or a sample yeah. of feature vectors where you're trying to then compute the primary angular because here it's a very very sparse space and remember that in your default you're starting off with each web page being a dimension out here right so it's a little bit different and the, the relationship is only about how they are correlated to each other or in this case linking to each other right so there is a wherever there is a connection there is a smaller stronger link and that's what you're trying to figure out in which dimension is this most well connected and so in that direction, as I said, and as you were saying, the projection, because it's a simple case, is just simply the value of that coordinate. So if I'm the 100th page, I look at the 100th value of my eigenvector, or any vector for that matter, that gives me the value of the projection of this page in that axis. Right? Which here, by definition, the way we set it up, is also the probability of a random surfer being on that page.
Okay? Yes. So. And basically taxation meant this term beta that we are adding to, to not get fully trapped. So if we had a bad structure in our transition matrix, you would get forever trapped into these kind of sinks, which basically all links lead in and none of them lead out. And so we want to add a finite probability, which is one minus beta in this case, that you'll be able to reappear or teleport onto any random site. The same idea, and we will see,